Uh, following that, it gives me great pleasure to be asked to do the introduction. I'm actually plugging in for Dr. Elizabeth Herrera. She uh, was prepared to do that, but she had to run off for a few minutes for an emergency. But uh, I personally know Dr. Levy for 32 years. He reminded me this morning that we met in 1987 in, of all places, Brussels, Belgium. At the time, he was faculty at Emory doing cardiac anesthesia. I was faculty here at Baylor at Methodist doing cardiac anesthesia. And we've known each other through the years. Uh, Jerry is, is one of the pillars of cardiac anesthesia and also cardiac critical care because he trained for both and he does both. He's currently a professor of anesthesiology, also, as you can see, professor of surgery, cardiothoracic, and co-director of the Cardiothoracic Surgical Intensive Care Unit at Duke University Medical Center. He has been there seven years. Before that, he had an outstanding career at Emory. Uh, at that time, he was uh, professor and deputy chair for research at Emory and chief of cardiothoracic anesthesia. And at Emory, I believe most of the cardiac anesthesiologists had double fellowships, meaning they did cardiac anesthesia and critical care. He was part of that group, and uh, many of them worked in both places. Um, he took his uh, medical degree at, uh, at the University of uh, Miami, Florida, and uh, interned in internal medicine there, and residency in the Department of Anesthesiology at Massachusetts General Hospital and Harvard Medical School, Boston. He was chief resident there, and then completed fellowships in, in um, cardiac anesthesia as well as critical care there at MGH. His clinical research has been wide and well known. Uh, for one thing, he has a total of 450 publications, including original research articles, reviews, books, book chapters, et cetera. He um, has been uh, very active in bleeding, coagulation, anticoagulation, uh, allergy, anaphylaxis. I certainly have heard him speak on many uh, wide variety of topics over the years. He's currently chair of the subcommittee on perioperative and critical care thrombosis and hemostasis for the International Society of Thrombosis and Hemostasis. He's executive editor of the journal Anesthesiology, and he's a consultant to the FDA's Biologic Products Advisory Committee. With that, I'm going to welcome Jerry to uh, Methodist and uh, to Houston. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. A privilege to be here. And thank Dr. Elizabeth uh, Herrera for the kind invite to talk about bleeding. And I think a really critical point for what we do, both uh, in a perioperative ICU or type setting. I had the privilege of working with Dr. Lumsden and Dr. Lee for years when they were at Emory. And um, I feel very lucky having worked with a lot of impressive individuals. Uh, for all of us who treat bleeding, which is uh, really part of what we do every day, there's a wonderful quote. For those of you who are movie fans from Predator, it featured two future governators, Arnold Schwarzenegger and uh, Jesse Ventura. And I don't know if you remember, uh, Arnold says to Jesse Ventura, you are bleeding. <laughs> and remember, Jesse goes, I ain't got time to bleed. Jesse wrote a book called I Ain't Got Time to Bleed, interestingly enough. But I think that's what we do every day is treat bleeding. And I think um, we've tried to do is, uh, with my interest in, in anaphylaxis hypersensitivity, got very interested in bleeding back in the 80s. I started out in medicine to be a hematologist, immunologist. You couldn't make a living as a clotter. I got interested in critical care. And we treat bleeding every day. My conflicts are I'm working with all the companies that make purified recombinant strategies. In particular, reversal of the new uh, non-vitamin K or oral anticoagulants. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that at the end. So let's just spend a minute or two talking about hemostasis. Hemostasis in, in a surgical critical care environment involves three major factors, the blood vessels, the coag proteins, and platelets. And we've all either stayed in the OR, gone back to the OR, or treated in the ICU bleeding for a defect in any one or all three of these. The problem is that a lot of the things we do with transfusional and other therapies is really not always based on great science. Um, and empiricism is really part of what we do every day. Interestingly, um, there's a great interest in patient blood management. But the thing that bugs me the most is not patient blood, it's patient red cell management. I mean, the red cell story to me has been beaten up. It's really time to work on. Uh, all the sticky stuff that we do, and that's kind of what my focus has been. So 
Hemostasis really is a very complex interaction of the blood, coag proteins, and all of the things that are involved. Blood circulates in the intravascular space, and the vascular endothelium is an incredible surface for anticoagulant effect. Injure it, you go from anticoagulant to procoagulant, platelets adhere, thrombins generated, and you activate that whole cascade. Basically, injuring the vascular endothelium exposes tissue factor. Tissue factor with seven, factor 7A, uh, with, the, with the activated form of seven, forms the 10As complex. Uh, the 10As then actually forms thrombin, and thrombin not only generates fibrinogen, but it also is a very potent activator for, for clot formation, as well as an activator for thrombin generation. Hi, Alan. We lost the screen. The other important point in terms of hemostasis is the fact that all of these steps are, have incredible amplification. And for instance, hemophilia, either A or B, hemophilia fact with factor eight or factor nine deficiency, hemophilics clot. They just don't make good clot. Why don't they make great clot? Where do they bleed into? They bleed into joints. Remember, joints are very rich in these glycosaminoglycan heparin-like molecules. So as a result, tissue factor, there's very little tissue factor in the joints. The pictures are kind of nice if you can get them up. Um, OK, bravo. This is, a, I think, particularly. So the clot that we want in a bleeding patient is the interaction of platelets and fibrinogen. The clot that cardiologists don't want in the coronary circulation is the interaction of platelets and fibrinogen. So it's kind of yin-yang, if you will. Second thing is that when a patient comes back to me from the operating room, three questions. Uh, what's your platelet count? What's your fibrinogen level? And are you on an antifibrinolytic? Uh, basically, not only do you want to generate clot, but you want to prevent its breakdown. And the increasing role of antifibrinolytics in traumatic injury and multiple things is really grown. And I think we'll talk more about that. The other important point is that um, the blood vessels, as I mentioned, I'm going to repeat it. The vascular endothelium is an amazing anticoagulant surface. This is a human internal memory artery. This is data that came out of my lab at Emory. I worked with David Harrison uh, on this work. Here's all the vascular smooth muscle. The endothelium has been stained for nitric oxide synthetase. So nitric oxide, prostacyclin are very potent antiplatelet agents. You release TPA from the blood vessel, as well as the whole glycocalyx with all the glycosaminoglycan heparinoid-like molecules that exist. So it's a, but it's also a very delicate surface that could be damaged with mechanical injury, surgery, in metabolic scenarios, typically sepsis. And one of the things that I've been working with in the ISCH is trying to redefine sepsis-induced coagulopathy because it's a critical point of endothelial dysfunction and DIC. So let's talk first about the use of platelet inhibitors. Uh, platelet inhibitors are the mainstay of antithrombotic issues. Um, Alan, remember where when we would do carotids, remember uh, Dr. Smith used to give uh, dextrans to inhibit platelets? Dextrans coat the surface, kind of interesting antiquated therapy, but um, platelet and arterial thrombosis is important. Uh, the, Platelet inhibitors of our current era are the P2Y12 inhibitors, clopidogrel, prasugrel, and ticagrelor. Clopidogrel is generic, extensively used. Ticagrelor um, is not the only one that's not a prodrug. Um, and for those who read New England Journal, there's a recent FAB fragment antibody to ticagrelor. The problem is ticagrelor is only 10% use in the general population. Uh, when patients come on the P2Y12s, everybody's been complaining about the lack of the new oral anticoagulant reversal. We haven't been able to reverse these agents in years, but there are some off-label considerations we'll talk about. Part of the problem when you have patients on antiplatelet agents is the, the inability to probably do a great platelet function assay. We look at number, but we don't have a good feel on platelet function. There are some very interesting tests to verify now the PFA 100. In Europe, they use this thing called the multiplate, which was developed by the guy who also developed the Rotem, uh, one of the viscoelastic tests. But the bottom line is we don't have a good handle on platelet function in a bleeding patient. We can 
do platelet function a patient going for surgery who has a high platelet count, normal platelet, you know, a reasonable platelet physiology. But the problem is we really can't define the platelet dysfunction in surgical patients, and as a result, we resort to empiric platelet transfusion. In cardiac surgery, big of an issue because platelets don't work. I'll take 20,000 platelets that work rather than 100,000 that don't work, but that's a whole separate issue, and we don't have a good therapeutic threshold to administer. Most of the data, almost all of the data, comes from oncologic cases where patients have hopefully intact vasculature. The other problem is the P2Y12s, clopidogrel is the prime example, has a very complex mechanism of how it inhibits platelets. If you do platelet function tests on anything but ADP, they all look normal. But it's very selective but important amplification step where activate platelets, ADP is released, it stimulates this ADP or P2Y12 receptor that then allows for expression of the 2B3A fibrinogen receptor. So platelets circulate in a quiescent state, get activated, a critical step, and that's what the ticagrelor, clopidogrel, and those drugs do. What do we do, uh, and how do you manage the patient who requires surgery? Well, unfortunately, lawyers read the package inserts, and it's suggested to wait at least five days. The advantage, the problem with clopidogrel is you get about 20 to 30 percent risk of um, resistance. Clopidogrel is a prodrug, it's a thionopyridine, it undergoes two metabolic steps versus ticagrelor is an active drug. So a lot of patients on it may actually not be working 100%. Um, if I had a stent and I was on clopidogrel, I'd probably consider antiplatelet testing. Um, and I think that's perhaps some of the complexity of instant thrombosis, but separate issue. The problem is you've loaded the patient with 600 milligrams of the cath lab and the levels are going up, a bigger issue. If you have to go for emergency surgery, I think you should document it. And then therapy is really multimodal based on empiricism. I think antifibrinolytics, whether platelets work or not to reverse the effect, nobody really knows. And it's specifically, it's considered a bigger problem with ticagrelor because it's, it's not a re irreversible inhibitor. So what we did in, in two studies published in the thrombosis literature is looked at the off-label, off-label use of recombinant 7A to reverse the uh, thionopyridine effect. Basically, 7A, recombinant 7A is approved for pa patients who have factor 8 or factor 9 inhibitors, and it's a bypassing agent for bleeding. But it's also approved for Glanzmann's thrombocenia. Glanzmann's is the congenital absence of the 2B3A receptors, and what it does is it allows for platelets to generate thrombin. And we've shown you reverse 70 to 80 percent of its effect. Again, emergency bleeding. Um, and something to think about, again, emphasize off-label. So let's talk now about the antithrombotics. Remember, we talked about antiplatelet effect. Platelets are critical for arterial thrombosis. Anticoagulants, the antithrombotics, are part of the venous thromboembolic prophylaxis, but it's a complexity of interaction that also occurs. Remember that heparin and low molecular weight heparin are antithrombin dependent. Low molecular weight heparin only inhibits factor 10A, and again is antithrombin dependent. Unfractionated heparin, because of the eight, 15, pentasaccharide, 15 to 18 pentasaccharide sequence, allows antithrombin to bind to thrombin um, and predominantly inhibits thrombin. The new non vitamin K oral anticoagulants, NOAX, DOAX, if you will, are either direct inhibitors of 10A, rivaroxaban, apixaban, edoxaban, and batrixaban or dabigatran, which nobody uses in the US anymore, a direct thrombin inhibitor. Again, these are antithrombin independent. One of the things that I think I just want to throw out is the incredible use of low molecular weight heparin in uh, oncologic and other scenarios for venous thromboembolic prophylaxis. Low molecular weight heparin has a great prolongation of its half-life with renal failure. You've got to be careful. Most clinicians are not that familiar with measuring its effect. You have to do an anti-10A level, um, and you can't really reverse it. The other thing is if you're on a DOAC, don't bridge with low molecular weight heparin. Do not, do not do that, because it has a longer half-life, renal elimination, and the 10As like apixaban and rivaroxaban are relatively cleared rapidly, even with some renal dysfunction. So 
One of the things that all of us have to deal with is the increasing use of the non-vitamin K oral anticoagulants. And in the US, it's mostly apixaban and rivaroxaban for the most part. What's really interesting is this data, which is over 100,000 patients, is pretty impressive, with about a 20% reduction in stroke. For remember, this is for its use for atrial fibrillation and stroke prevention. Uh, about 50% reduction in hemorrhagic stroke, uh, about half reduction in intracranial bleeding, and about a 10% reduction in all-cause mortality. The interesting thing about, for those of you who've used those for perioperative venous thromboembolic prophylaxis compared to warfarin, is you give it in two to four hours, you're therapeutic. You don't even have to measure a level. In all of these studies, despite the careful uh, evaluation and following the patient, warfarin is only therapeutic about 65% of the time. And that pharmacodynamic variability is probably also accounts for this effect. So in a surgical setting, some of the caveats on the, um, on the DOAX, for minor bleeding risk, you want to treat them like low molecular weight heparin or warfarin. If you have urgent procedures that are semi-elective, by 48 hours, these drugs are really cleared pretty rapidly. For emergency surgery and you have to go through surgery, you really have to think about them at great risk for bleeding. You don't want to stick stuff in their spinal canal, neuroaxial procedures, and renal function is really important. If a patient comes in on a DOAC, two or three questions. When was the last time they got the drug? Because the clearance is really important. And what's the renal function? This was a particular problem with the bigotran, far less with apixaban and rivaroxaban. There are multiple recommendations. The Europeans have sort of taken the lead on this. I'm not really going to talk about the bigotran because I've been involved with the development of the FAB fragment reversal called idarucizumab, praxbine. So we now have a solution that totally reversed it, and I'll show you that data. But the real issue is what to do with apixaban and rivaroxaban. For high-risk patients, for high-risk bleeding, I think vascular surgery, cardiac surgery, if possible, you want to wait at least two days. But you can also measure levels of the drug. And if you can't measure a specific level and your lab doesn't have that, you can do a quantitative anti-10A assay. And this is what's used when the patient comes in with an intracranial hemorrhage and you don't have a good history what the drug may be. Monitoring the effects is important to think about. Dabigatran is a direct thrombin inhibitor, so like river, it like whether you're using heparin, um, argatraban, or bivalvertin, you can look at partial thromboplastin time, diluted thrombin times, but this drug is not really used that much. Uh, and partial thromboplastin time is very effective. For rivaroxaban and apixaban, you have to do a very specific or calibrated anti-10A assay. Um, the literature suggests you can use your prothrombin time to look at Rivaroxaban, because it's used in about twice the highest concentration as apixaban. The problem is anybody comes in with traumatic injury, their INR is 1.2 to 1.3, so I don't think it's, it's um, helpful. Dr. Herrera asked me to talk about heparin-induced thrombocytopenia as part of this presentation. And I've been very interested in this phenomenon because it's uh, an immune-mediated coagulopathy where it's a really interesting paradigm shift where an anticoagulant causes a procoagulant effect. Heparin, a ubiquitous environmental antigen in what we do, uh, used extensively in cardiovascular medicine, and, I, and it's an ongoing issue, although it's probably less since they've cleaned up heparin about 10 years ago. The immune-mediated heparin-induced thrombocytopenia is basically an, a specific IgG-type antibody directed against platelet factor four um, that is sort of a new antigen, a neoepitope, if you will, um, formed after heparin administration. And when you send a hit assay, what you're really measuring is that platelet factor for antigen. The clinical presentation is usually about five days, four to five days after initial exposure with a drop, usually 50% or less of your platelet count. Um, and as part of this evaluation, it's always helpful to do a 4T score to look at thrombosis, timing, and other causes. And before I prescribe bivalvulin and argatraban in an ICU setting, we do a 4T score as for the probability of true hit. The problem is thrombosis um, is equally matched to other uh, score variables, and I think a bit of a problem, but separate issue. 
The onset typically with new exposure is about four to five days initially. The problem is patients may have prior exposure to heparin. So if you give heparin and you have a hypersensitivity, severe drop in blood pressure, like an anaphylactic syndrome, pulmonary hypertension, and some of those other manifestations, they probably have an antibody to it. And it can manifest that, but it's a bit uncommon. And then there's some delayed hit manifestations. You send the patient home and they come back with this syndrome. Unusual, but it's been reported in the literature. The problem in our setting in your patients postoperatively is thrombocytopenia is very common. And it can be really difficult sometimes to sort out but based on um, Ted Workington, Andreas Grinecker's work, the mean drop in platelet count, and it usually plateaus about 50,000. The lowest level is about 20,000, but if it comes less than 20,000, you should probably think about some other immune-mediated thrombocytopenia, bone marrow abnormality, or maybe even like DIC or sepsis. And all of these things are part of the complexity of diagnosing it in the ICU. So we talked about platelets producing arterial thrombotic effects, critical to arterial thrombosis. The problem in HIT, even though it's a platelet-mediated effect, the risk of venous versus arterial thrombosis is about four to one. So it really speaks to the crosstalk between thrombin and platelets, platelet activation. And I don't know, I've been fascinated with HIT and the thrombotic manifestation. But the classic manifestations is that acrocyanosis you can get, but it looks just like DIC and septic shock. And the other cause of acrocyanosis is also acute shock liver. And Workington showed this, and there's been a, several interesting studies. Shock liver, DIC, and HIT are three of the major causes of platelet-mediated acrocyanosis. The problem is diagnosing it in the ICU. In addition to heparin, you've got an intraortic balloon pump. After cardiopulmonary bypass, the platelet drops about 40 to 60% ECMO or any other scenario. And then there's some other scenarios. But it can be really tricky sometimes to look at it. But remember, this is one of the things you consider in the 4T score. I'm only going to quote one article um, in HIT literature. And I think it's really important. When somebody tells me the patient's hit positive, I'll say, well, how do you know? What's the optical density of the ELISA? Because Workington in Canada, he doesn't even measure ELISA. He goes straight to a serotonin release assay. If you do a zillion serotonin release assay, that's easy. For us, sending the lab out takes at least three to five days. But the important point is it's very common to get antibody formation. You may not have a functional prothrombotic state, even though the antibodies form. Basically, what they did is took about 1,500 patients, looked at both ELISA and looked at serotonin release assay. And basically, you can see that it's very common to get a low-level optical density, but not positive serotonin release. The bluish bars are serotonin release. But you can see as the optical density increases, kind of like the higher titer, you get a more a greater risk for true SRA positivity. And let me just sort of go over this data, because I think it's really important. Most of the ELISAs you use for HIT turn positive after 0.4 optical density, although there's some new assays out there that's totally different. But the standard ones that most labs use, and I'm not sure what they use here, it goes positive at 0.4 to 1. But the risk of true SRA is less than 5%. From 1 to 1 1.4, it's 20% based on serotonin release assay. 1.4 to 2 is 50%, and greater than 2, it's about 90%. So what the Dukies do is we send the ELISA, and if it's positive, then they send the serotonin release assay to determine. The problem is that the optical density you get, I have a patient on ECMO whose now um, optical density is, say, 0 0.8, 1.2, um, and I keep giving heparin, the optical density in the titer may increase, and you may turn positive because a week later you're getting the results. Increasingly for ECMO, people are just switching over to bifalodin for the lack of need of antithrombin or argatroban. Again, interesting paradigm. So for HIT, what are the current agents in 2019? Uh, Danaproid, which was Orgaran, was one of the first agents approved. Um, it's now being restudied, and there's a big study coming out that I'm involved with. But the direct thrombin inhibitors, bivalerdin, 
and argatroban are the mainstays of therapy. If the patient needs cardiac surgery, though, one of the things that there are several interesting reports, and this all emanated out of Duke, is the use of plasmapheresis. Remember, it's an IgG antibody. It's not an amnestic response because it's due to platelet activation. You can remove the antibodies to the point you're ELISA negative, proceed with heparin for cardiopulmonary bypass, and then post-op switch back to a drug like bivalorin and argatroban. Interesting thought. There's a lot of literature out there, but I think important perspective. So we talked about anticoagulants. Let's talk about my more favorite subject, procoagulants, treating bleeding. Hemostatic agents. Remember, hemostasis basically means stopping bleeding. The mainstays of therapy we use in a, a perioperative cardiovascular setting are the antifibrinolytics, protamine, DDAVP, off-label 7A, factor concentrates in particular in Europe. I'm not going to talk about the topical hemostatic agents, but I think they're very interesting because if you look at the data um, uh, on efficacy, it's, it's really, um, uh, I think, not necessarily that supportive, but it makes sense from, I think, a theoretical perspective to put agents. And we've gotten off of the, the bovine thrombin to purified and recombinant thrombin preparations, very important for both hypersensitivity and immune-mediated uh, coagulopathy. And then I'm going to finish up talking about some of the current work on reversal of the new vitamin K, non-vitamin K oral anticoagulants, a very emerging and interesting concept. One of the main state therapies, both traumatic, surgical, and other bleeding, is the use of antifibrinolytics. I did a lot of the work in the 90s with a protonin, got removed from the market. Um, unfortunately, based on some very complex data, we're not going to talk about it, but it's being re, it, re um, approved back in Europe, in England, uh, and in Europe, but a uh, separate issue. But we're going to focus on the mainstay areas of lysine analogs, tranexamic acid and epsilon amino caproic acid. These are molecules that, remember that plasmin, plasminogen, recognizes a lysine residue in proteins. By sort of flooding the field with a kind of cogener, you prevent and inhibit plasminogen and plasmin. The data is extensive on its use in elective surgery, cardiac, and, and orthopedic, and other procedures. Um, Interestingly, almost all of the data out there is pretty much tranexamic acid. There's a small number of epsilon aminocaproic acid studies. The US uses Amicar, and uh, I think it's more from tradition, but most of the work out there is all tranexamic acid. Remember that tranexamic acid and Amicar look a lot like lysine. Um, basically, Amicar has two carbons greater, and tranexamic acid uses a cyclic uh, four carbon structure. One, two, three, four carbons, one, two, three, four, and then all of these other um, uh, similar looking molecules that look like um, uh, lysine. So a few comments that the data, uh, at least in a lot of surgical patients, is, is relatively small, but there have been several big studies in the NEJM, again, showing efficacy and safety of at least tranexamic acid. And again, most of the data is tranexamic acid, not Amicar. The doses of tranexamic acid range in heart surgery from 2 to 25 grams. Most clinicians use about 4 to 6 grams. After 4 to 6 grams, you run the risk of seizures. Um, there is increasing use for trauma. And, and there's also the woman study in postpartum hemorrhage. I'll mention that. Remember that Amicar has been taken out from many European countries because of the risk of rhabdomyolysis as well as renal failure. Um, and anybody has any questions about tranexamic acid and safety, I'm not sure if you realize it, but it's used extensively for excessive menstrual bleeding at a dose of 1.3 grams POTID for five days with an impressive safety uh, record. So again, and without a history of seizures. One of the things that really sort of blossomed tranexamic acid use in traumatic injury is the CRASH-2 study I reviewed for Lancet. 20,000 patients worldwide randomized to a gram load and a gram over eight hours. The primary endpoint was a reduction in mortality as well as bleeding. The reduction in mortality was only about 1.5%, and bleeding-related mortality only reduced 1%, with no differences in transfusion. The problem is 
75% of this data was done in third world countries where they didn't have a blood bank. The best benefit was giving it within three hours. Um, and I think it really should be er administered as early as possible. The question is, how did it show a reduction in mortality? Well, remember, again, fibrinolysis, whenever you generate clot, thrombin, or massive tissue injury, is part of both TPA release and through calocrine and contact activation, plasmin is generated. Plasmin and TPA basically lyses clot, specifically fibrinogen, fibrin, but it also will affect other cellular elements, including cleaving glycoprotein 1B, 2B, 3A receptors, so it induces a mainstream major coagulopathy. I wrote the editorial for the CRASH-2 study, and this is just my editorial that really focuses on the anti-inflammatory effect of plasmin. Plasmin not only causes this coagulopathy through all of the things we talked about, but it's a very potent complement activator. It activates the C1 esterase. If you have hereditary angioedema, you're on a, con a chronic antifibrinolytic. Um, it activates inflammatory cells and produces a lot of complex pro-inflammatory responses. The other thing that plasmin does, it actually will create prothrombin to thrombin. In fact, when we created an, uh, an in vitro fibrinolysis model and we added TPA, the blood clotted. And what happens is it's just a very nonspecific enzymatic process. So traumatic injury, bleeding, um, inhibiting plasmin is critical. What's great in surgical patients, you can prophylax. Have the drug on board before the injury and prevent some of this complex responses. If there's only one downside of tranexamic acid, it's seizures. And the reason we see seizures is because this molecule looks probably a lot like gamma aminobutyric acid, the sort of benzodiazepine that gets secreted in the brain. The dosing is about four to six grams and higher. The bottom line is that, and I, we have the safety data from its use as Lysteta and Minometaraja. But again, I think that's the downside. We actually measured plasma levels relatively high in the CSF in some of the large aortic uh, patients where they have a spinal drain. Bottom line, I think you limit your dose to four to six grams, the risk of seizures will be lower. Let's talk about some other pharmacotherapy, specifically DDAVP or, or desmopressin. It used extensively. Uh, whether it works or not is a whole separate question. Remember that DDAVP is the V2 analog of arginine vasopressin. What does it do? It releases von Willebrand factor from the uh, Weibo-Pilate bodies of the vascular endothelium. Um, and it's used extensively in surgical patients, but the data on efficacy is really minimal at best. Um, when it's used, it's used after transfusions and other multimodal therapies. Uh, but bottom line, we use it a lot. I think if you're on arginine vasopressin, you're giving a V2 analog. Whether it works or not is an interesting scenario, but used extensively as part of, again, multimodal therapy. Protamine, um, protamine is an interesting molecule. It's sort of where I started back in the 80s, trying to develop protamine alternatives and looking and understanding the whole concept of protamine reversal. Despite all the new anticoagulants, heparin and protamine is gonna be here for a long time because you can take the patient and make them highly anticoagulated and reverse it with protamine, one of the few true reversal agents. Protamine is probably one of the more uh, weirder molecules we use. It's a basic polypeptide isolated from salmon sperm. It's basically a histone. Remember histones from school are basic uh, polypeptides that provide structural integrity to DNA. They're also involved in sepsis as well as uh, injury, but the bottom line is that we give this interesting molecule. It's 70% arginine which gives it its very low PKA, of, or high PKA of 11.5, and it basically binds in a nonspecific acid-base interaction. Um, rebound occurs probably two to three hours, and there are really no alternatives despite a lot of work that's been done. I was always told that excess protamine was bad. We actually did the experiment, um, and one of the things is that you get your lowest activated clotting time in a patient anticoagulated in cardiac surgery by giving the exact ratio or the lowest stoichiometric ratio required to reverse uh, heparin. The bottom line is that uh, everybody says you're bleeding, give more protamine, give more protamine, give more protamine. That may not be great because it has a very complex series of anticoagulant effects. 
Um, and one of the advantages of the HEPCON, the heparin protamine titration, it tells the exact amount to give. And then thinking about giving additional dosing for rebound, maybe 50 milligrams over a couple hours. Bottom line, avoid excess protamine. The other thing about protamine is anaphylaxis can occur. We did two large studies in almost 5,000 patients. The risk in all patients is relatively low, one in 1,500. In the NPH diabetics, it was 1% to 2% because the P stands for protamine, and they get sensitized to it. The bottom line is that NPH insulin is not used that much, so it's less of an issue. The literature has made um, there are a lot of description of protamine reactions. The bottom line is that the life-threatening reactions are anaphylaxis due to IgE or IgG antibodies. This causes vasodilatory shock. This causes most likely the pulmonary vasoconstrictive responses. But protamine, when given too fast, can cause a lot of pro-inflammatory effects, complement activation, and give it relatively slowly, no faster than 25 to 50 milligrams per minute. Let's move on to the, probably some of the more interesting things about managing bleeding that's really evolving in a lot of the paradigms. And the recent European guidelines for treating traumatic bleeding has come out. Factor concentrates are increasingly used. Factor concentrates like fibrinogen concentrates, because they don't have cryoprecipitate in Europe, uh, prothrombin complex concentrates to treat bleeding. Uh, are increasingly used because they're readily available. They don't require cross-matching. They're viral-free. They're highly purified, no alloimmunization. Um, and despite the fact that we have PCCs in the US, the four-component PCCs are only approved for reversal of warfarin. But there are three-component PCCs, Profil9 and Bebulin, that are used extensively. And we've reported a fair amount of this literature. What are the factor concentrates primarily? Well, um, we talked about the four-factor PCCs that contain 2, 7, 9, and 10. But the current four-component PCC in the US is called K-Centra. In Europe, it's called Beriplex. And it has a little protein CNS in it. Plasma has all of these factors. And then there is an activated PCC called FIBA, factor eight inhibitory bypassing activity. This stuff has lots of activation factors. Um, it's been studied, but it's really primarily approved for hemophilia with inhibitors. The three component PCCs lack factor seven. And how much factor seven do you need is an interesting concept. But this is what we use off-label, off-label in treating surgical bleeds because this has specific labeling and this does not. And then recombinant 7A, had a lot of interest about 10 years ago. There's still interesting data in heart surgery, but again, um, not really used in most scenarios because of the efficacy data. One of the things that I just want to remind you about, if you have a patient coming in for surgery on warfarin, um, and you need to emergently reverse the anticoagulations, don't give plasma. Give four-component PCC, specifically K-Centra, because First thing, um, there's not only transfusion-related acute lung injury most commonly associated with plasma, but it's also you get transfusion-associated circulatory overload. That 50-kilogram little woman in heart failure who you give two to four units of plasma, and now you have pulmonary edema. The other important point is that this is, I think, just shows you the factor levels associated with different INRs. If your INR is two, it corresponds to levels of about 40 to 45 percent. An INR of three is about 20 to 25 percent. The reason it takes you three to five days to get a steady state on your INR is because you're inhibiting 2, 7, 9, and 10, and it responds in a very curvilinear relationship. The only way you're going to get to 100 percent activity is to use a factor concentrate. So for warfarin reversal, for emergency surgery, the use of four component prothrombin complex concentrates, I think, are critical. The other thing is do not use recombinant 7A. People are still using 7A for warfarin reversal. This was a cool study we did uh, at, at Emory looking at probably the best assay for looking at reversal called thrombin generation. It's this fluorometric assay that looks at the ability to generate thrombin. You don't generate thrombin. You don't clot. A normal thrombin generation curve has this sort of peak on and, and relatively early onset. If you take blood 
from a patient with an INR5, it's probably 10 to 15% factor levels. And look at thrombin generation, it's pretty wincy as shown here. Give recombinant 7A, guess what? Your INR goes less than one, but look what happens to thrombin generation. The only way you can normalize your thrombin generation is with factor repletion. And we still use 7A off-label in cardiac surgical bleeding because there's some thrombin generation issue. It's probably one of the only scenarios where there's efficacy, much lower doses, one to two milligram. But I can always tell when the patient's got 7A because the INR comes back 0.9 or 0.8. It totally normalizes the INR, but it doesn't affect thrombin generation. All coagulation tests can be gamed, kind of like going to Vegas, figure out those games you can win. Let's talk about probably one of the most critical coagulation proteins that exist when a bleeding patient in a surgical critical care environment, and it's fibrinogen. Fibrinogen circulates at probably the highest of all the proteins, about seven to eight micromolar. Antithrombin is about 2.6 micromolar, and then thrombin is somewhere in about you know, two to three micromolar, the three most important protein. Fibrinogen is a critical protein for clot and clot formation. These big round guys are red cells that get trapped. Platelets are much smaller, but it's kind of like the meshwork of clot is platelet fibrinogen. It's really important when you're bleeding to think about what the fibrinogen level as well as certainly the platelets. Fibrinogen, remember, binds to the 2B3A receptor on platelets that are expressed. If platelets are dysfunctional, they won't express it, and then transfusion of platelets is something to think about. So one of the things that we've worked through the years is teaching clinicians, as well as blood bankers, the importance of normalizing fibrinogen. Normal levels are 200 to 400 milligrams per deciliter. The older blood bankers said you don't transfuse till you're about 100 milligrams per deciliter. That's wrong. The other problem is that if your fibrinogen drops below 100 to about 80 to 100 milligrams per deciliter, your PT, PTT will go up because it's a clot-based assay. Very important, and the testing may not always be effective. And then you give plasma, and you're not repleting fibrinogen. The other point is, years ago, we noticed when we repleted fibrinogen uh, with cryoprecipitates, what's used in the US, that the viscoelastic properties, TEG, ROTEM, are normalized. In the United States, we use cryoprecipitate. In Europe and other countries, they don't have cryo because it's multi-donor. But cryo is an interesting product. The other name for cryo is antihemophilic factor because it contains a lot of factor VIII, but it also contains von Willebrand factor. The VAD patients, the ECMO patients, all probably consume von Willebrand factor. If you have DIC, you're consuming von Willebrand factor. It allows for platelets to adhere to damaged blood vessels. It contains fibrinogen. It contains factor 13. It contains fibronectin. I don't know about you all, but when I shoot skeet, I use a 12-gauge shotgun with a wide blast. Cryoprecipitate is like a... It gives you that wide blast with a lot of microparticles that also may be very important procoagulant. When you do an analysis of a lot of these products, these microparticles may be also why you're getting procoagulant effects. The downside, if you have a transplant, you're also probably getting some sensitization, um, and, and uh, there's a lot of HLA and other antigens. So again, it's quite yin-yang, but cryo is an interesting product. The Canadians want cryo off the shelf and replace it with fibrinogen. We're going to have cryo for some years. We've looked a lot at fibrinogen in, uh, in the journal Blood. Tim Goodenow, who's head of transfusion medicine at Stanford, and I wrote a, a therapeutic sort of algorithm for using fibrinogen. And if you have clinically important bleeding, surgical, traumatic, or whatever, um, first thing, send all your coagulation tests, including fibrinogen. Maintain homeostasis, normothermia. And as multimodal therapy, the crash two dosing, a gram load of tranexamic acid, a gram over eight hours. Fibrinogen less than two, cryoprecipitate or fibrinogen. Your platelet count less than 100,000 with a life threatening bleed transfusion. And if your INR is greater than about 1.7 or 1.8, um, think about either factor concentrates if you're European and or potentially plasma, fresh frozen plasma. And if you're bleeding a lot, obviously a massive transfusion protocol. But despite the evolution of massive transfusion protocols, the Europeans now are switching back to goal-directed therapy and with algorithms, not just give one to one to one or one to two to one to one, but trying to figure out what the defect is using TEG or ROTEM and transfusing specific therapy. I think a really important perspective.
The other important point is that therapy needs to be multimodal. Not just fibrinogen, not just tranexamic acid, not just fix the hole, but a multimodal approach. This is kind of a cool study looking at Rotem, where we had coagulopathic blood, i.e. gave TPA and created fibrinolytic. This is what a normal Rotem looks like. Um, a coagulopathic takes a long time to clot. You don't get good clot, and you lyse. Activator, fibrinogen, um, the only way you ever restore a normal clot is by giving substrate like fibrinogen. Activators like, for instance, 7A, PCCs, or plasma, and an antifibrinolytic, i.e. protonin. A protonin is what is in your tissue glues because tranexamic acid and the other agents are probably neurotoxic. I'm gonna finish up in the next few minutes, five minutes, talking about the reversal of the new agents. As a reminder, the safety was without any kind of reversal strategies. They have super short half-lives. They're reversible anticoagulants. But I think in any scenario, you need to think about bleeding. The reversal agents, also called antidotes, are um, available. The Bigotran, I was involved on the steering committee for its reversal. It's an FAB fragment directed against the Bigotran. Um, we reported the more recent study of 500 patients, 200 surgical, and 300 bleeding patients. When you give this FAB fragment five grams, you get immediate reversal of the anticoagulant effect for up to about 24 hours. The diluted thrombin time, think of it as a very sensitive PTT. And we had, interestingly, 24 acute abdomens, about 20 bony fractures, 18 cardiovascular, five aortic uh, dissections, three heart transplants, a lot of critically ill complex patients. Based on the surgeon perspective, 93.4% had normal hemostasis, 5% mildly abnormal, and nobody had severely abnormal hemostasis. This drug takes the bigotran out of the process. The problem is nobody uses the bigotran anymore, at least in the United States. Where we really need the focus in are reversing the anti-10A agents. The drug that was approved about six to 12 months ago is the drug Andexanet. It's a 10A mimetic that competitively binds with the 10A agents. The problem is it only works for two to three hours. In the volunteer study that Deb Siegel reported, basically you load a bolus and infusion. Just the bolus and infusion is shown here. You bolus and you infuse, and then two to three hours later, what happens? The levels return to the placebo and match metabolism in the body. The drug only works for two to three hours. The larger database of 350 patients was recently reported in the New England Journal. Again, bolus infusion, and then by four hours, the levels recur and meet metabolic elimination. So what do we do with this data? The problem is the study had about 64% intracranial hemorrhage, 26% GI bleeds. There's no surgical data. The duration is only three hours. It's $25,000 to $50,000 to use it. You can't anticoagulate with heparin. It reverses heparin and low molecular weight heparin. Um, and further studies are evaluating it. So there's increasing off-label use of this drug. Don't use it in surgical patients. What should you do? I'm going to suggest an off-label consideration based on data on the use of prothrombin complex concentrates. There is an extensive amount of data showing that it does reverse the anticoagulant effect, restores thrombin generation, and has the potential to decrease bleeding. I've been involved in several of these studies. Marcel Levy and I looked at three and four factor PCCs showing them both in rivaroxaban anticoagulation. Zaheer showed that using a skin biopsy model, put a hole in a, in a volunteer that PCCs reversed the bleeding and restored thrombin generation. We looked at rivaroxaban, showed that you restored thrombin generation, but it didn't reduce bleeding. The problem was we used double the dose of standard rivaroxaban. However, there are two studies showing that in bleeding patients, a 2,000 unit of PCC is effective. Basically effective in 70% of patients, this is the, um, the, the study by Majid, showed that in intracranial hemorrhage reversal, GI bleeding, it was effective in about 70%. The problem is once you bleed in your head, you're already destined to adverse outcomes. And in, in uh, Sam Schulman's study, um, it with efficacy was good in 65%, moderate in 25%, using a 2,000 unit off-label, off-label unit of PCCs. I think in that scenario, 
If the patient requires emergency surgery, again, what's your renal function? When was the last dose? And again, unlike the bigotran, these drugs don't accumulate in renal failure. So one of the things about managing bleedings with these new agents is thinking about how emergent the bleeding is. Obviously, an intracranial hemorrhage is an emergency. Whether it affects or improves outcome is different. Aortic dissection, after the dissection coming off bypass or whatever procedural, then think about as part of a multimodal therapy, the off-label use of PCCs. Um, if you can wait, the drugs are cleared rapidly. They're reversible inhibitors. And remember, always send standard coagulation tests, fibrinogen, and all the other things we talked about. Reversal strategies are only part of a multimodal perspective. They take the anticoagulant out. But one of the things you have to think about what you do every day is manage hemodynamic and hemostatic resuscitation of your patients. Managing bleeding, basically, just a, again, a sort of a summary. Don't forget to send coag tests. If you have them, the Rotem tags are important, I think. Fibrinogen platelet, think about antifibrinolytics. And one thing clinicians don't always think about, treat anemia. There's an interesting growing role of red cells in clot formation. Furthermore, it's thought in the microcirculation. It marginates platelets. And it's something that you know, not always focused on. I think every hospital should have a bleeding algorithm for management their DOAC patients. So in summary, bleeding is really complex. Patients bleed due to multiple issues. Part of my interest is developing alternatives to allogeneic blood products. I think antifibrinolytics are particularly important. And I believe re purified recombinant products are in our future as therapeutic approaches. They're increasingly used in part of the algorithm in Europe. And remember that fibrinogen is a critical component. Ask what the level is. Think about treating it in a bleeding patient. So languages are my hobby. For those of you who have any interest in some of the Asian languages, the kanji character for blood is this, as shown here on the left, which is sacrifice at the altar. Imagine all the blood coming down. I think it looks a lot like a plurvac, frankly. And the age-old philosophical question, is your plurvac half full or half empty? Thank you all very much. And uh, are there questions? Uh, please, uh, their microphones are available. Jennifer has one here. There's one on that side of the room. Gary. Hello. Hey, Dr. Levy. Thank you for a great talk. Uh, after cardiac surgery here, we typically send platelet count, fibrinogen levels, PTINR, uh, XTEM, and FibTEMs. And it's not uncommon to have a fibrinogen level come back in the, you know, the greater than 200 normal range. But Do you send fibrinogen and FibTem, or are you extrapolating it from the FibTem? Uh, we send them separately. Yes. Why do you send a FibTem if you're sending a fibrinogen level? Well, that, that's part of my question. So I've noticed the phenomenon of having a normal fibrinogen level with a maximum clot formation on the FibTem of less than 10 in the 7 to 8 range fairly often. And then in the setting of clinical bleeding, even though the fibrinogen count is normal, with normal other coax, then we'll go ahead and treat either with fibrinogen concentrate or with uh, cryoprecipitate. So you use fibrinogen concentrate we, here? We've been blessed to have, you know, uh, PCCs and fibrinogen concentrate for a couple years here now because of our bloodless population. So, you know, one of the advantages of cryo in patients after surgery is that you have von Willebrand factor. Cryo is so, um, there's so much stuff in cryo that you know, maybe if you have refractory bleeding, you know, it's one thing you can't really measure is the role of von Willebrand factor, especially if you have a VAD, ventricular assist device, or, or some of the other scenario. But also bypass really does chew up von Willebrand factor. So the FIPTIM basically takes the platelet function out of the test. It uses a molecule called cytochalasin. The, uh, the TEG uses uh, abcixumab. But I mean, all those tests, like everything, have some interesting functionality and issues. Uh, I like fibrinogen levels. Um, the XTIM is, has some interesting other paradigms that can be confusing, but um, I just like to see the fibrinogen level. The problem is that the, that the role of the vasculature is always an issue. And, you know, is there a long pump run? Do you have a consumptive effect? The other thing is postoperatively, you always have to think about fibrinolysis as well. So I think anybody's bleeding, they need to have an antifibrinolytic infusion as well. But I mean, it's so multimodal. Uh, to answer your question, I'm not sure what your question was, sorry. The, the question was, 
have you seen this fine phenomenon of on the fib tem have a decrease you know functional aspect of fibrinogen whereas your normal count of fibrinogen so factor 13 plays also a role in the fib tem that's the sort of the cross linking and the formation because you've taken out the platelet effect the Europeans used the FibTem to determine whether to give a factor 13. I did two studies with recombinant factor 13. Doesn't do much. Factor 13 is a transglutamase that allows for cross-linking of fibrinogen to make it stronger and sort of more durable and more clot fibrinolytic and more break more resistant to breakdown. But um, you know, I, I've never been completely sure what to do with the FibTem. But it, when you give cryo, it's, it's not an issue because you're giving factor 13. You're giving von Willebrand factor. You know, one of the things is that what factors are you not giving the patient bleeding and there's no surgical hole or whatever that needs to be considered. The other advantage postoperatively, the Rotem is totally normal and you're bleeding a lot, it's a hole. It's a very helpful sort of adjunct assay to the big picture. But I think that may be the issue is that you need von Willebrand factor and or factor 13. It's not an issue for me because I give cryoprecipitate. Fibrinogen concentrate, we reserve for OB hemorrhage. Yeah. And Jerry, first of all, thank you for coming down. I mean, your contribution in this field is you're clearly the leader in the United States, if not across the world. Um, and thank you for that. Uh, two questions. One's pretty basic and the other one's a little more philosophical. Uh, you said not to bridge the patients who are on DOAX with a low molecular what was that? Uh, not what? Not to, not to bridge. Bridge, yeah. Can so you, Can I'm, you elaborate a little bit on that? Because we do, or we selectively do. You don't think it's worthwhile doing that? I think that it makes, so there's some really cool bridging studies that are emerging. I work with Jim Ducatis, Alex Baropoulos. That's what our section of the ISTH that I'm chair of, the periop critical care group, Deb, Deb, Deb uh, the woman who did this DOAC study, um, I don't, I think there's a whole reevaluation of bridging. So for instance, Alan, yeah. on an intraortic balloon pump, everybody starts heparin. Why do they start heparin? I ask, why is heparin started for an intraortic balloon pump? It's an arterial, why, why do we do that? I don't mean to switch, but it's sort of things that are done, sure. unclear. I think the low molecular weight heparin, DOACs even probably have a shorter life than low molecular weight heparin. And if you have renal function in particular, the question is, what's the patient? What are you bridging? Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, I think if you want to bridge, to me, it makes far more sense to use unfractionated heparin as infusion, especially if they're a surgical patient, because you can reverse it. You can follow it easier with a standard coagulation test. But in, in the patient we see in clinic who were setting up elective surgery, and we've got to stop basically the DOACs. So, but the thing is that the DOACs probably have shorter half-lives than low molecular weight heparin. They seem to be less, um, yeah. the half, even with renal dysfunction, they still clear. We had an aortic, uh, we had an aortic dissection come in um, for emergency surgery. You know, it always is red flag. So, but I can get a, I can get a DOAC level. Um, of, it was a patient on rivaroxaban. And he took it, 20, I said, when did you last take it? 24 hours ago. The level was zero. The other thing is if you're bleeding, you're plasmapheresing the level, the drug as well. I think it makes, doesn't make any sense to bridge with low molecular weight heparin because the half-life's longer with renal dysfunction. And the DOACs are, are I mean, it's pretty impressive. And your level, the magical level is probably 30 to 40 nanograms per mil or less. That's probably you know, the, the critical level based on European and other data. So the philosophical question is we use systemic anticoagulation because we want a regional effect. The side effects are systemic anticoagulation. But for example, we put somebody in cardiopulmonary bypass, we really want the bypass set up anticoagulated, but the downside is everything flows systemically. And so there have been things like heparin bonding of circuits, heparin bonding of vascular grafts. What's your feeling about trying to place an anticoagulant in a circuit and is it effective? I think it's great if you want to use a molecular sieve to remove your antithrombin, it's great. Uh, you know, I used to put, use columns where you coat it with stuff and you can take out, it's great, take out all the patient's antithrombin, let it bind to the circuit and there's nothing going back. Um, I mean, it makes zero sense to stick heparin on the circuit. It makes a lot of sense to, to make the circuits less stickier. And you know, from work that you did with graphs and other things, Embed nitric oxide, embed stuff that really is non, you know, but, but heparin is not the molecule. 
to, to put on there. You know, the, the glycocalyx of the vasculature is a far more complex set of glycosaminoglycan, but it makes no sense. And you know that the heparin bonded circuit for bypass, which was like hot for ages, is a problem because it basically sieves out your antithrombin, which you need to, to sort of, I think, preserve. I, didn't, I never understood it. I totally agree with you philosophically. If you want to stick something, stick a novel molecule. We can give heparin. The other interesting thing is that we've been spending a quarter of a century trying to figure out what to do with antithrombin. And um, interestingly, in the DIC studies, in sepsis study, if you're coagulopathic and have DIC, and most common causes sepsis, septic shock, the patients who got antithrombin without concomitant heparin had improved survival because heparin preferentially binds it in the circulation versus allowing it to absorb to the surface and providing an anticoagulant sort of milieu. It's a really interesting phenomenon. Improve survival by improving the anticoagulant effect of the circulation. Really important, I think. What do you think? I don't know, but, but let me give you one other presentation. And that was, we do a lot of transcranial Doppler monitoring. And one of the real interesting observations with, with VADs, that when you let the um, anticoagulation drop below a certain threshold, you could start seeing active embolization into the head. And so it's one way of trying to look at the effects of anticoagulation and use a surrogate target of what we think are probably platelet emboli, which are being generated once you get below certain thresholds. But you know, a lot of that stuff you see, I think is also red cell hemolysis too. You know, the, we, you, we call the impella the, the, uh, the hemolyzer. I mean, it's really crazy. Um, there's, the HeartMate 3 is, you, this is probably, your, I think you're probably referring to HeartMate 2. The HeartMate 3 is an amazing new machine that um, will be off anticoagulation for days and the LDH remains two to 300. But I think, do you think it's just platelets? I think it's red cell hemolysis and lots of stuff in that microparticle. Or can you define differences? I'm not that no, sure. You can't define differences, but it did seem to be anticoagulation related. Once you basically let the APTT drop below a certain threshold, you'd start to see higher levels actually taking place. And so it was a way of trying to use a surrogate method of minimizing the amount of anticoagulation to stop the pump thrombosing, but also minimize the amount of uh, debris going on up into the head and using some sort of clinical objective criteria rather than just measure a systemic anticoagulation level to, to titrate the anticoagulation. So, you know, one of the things that happens is that somebody have an INR of say three, 3.5 and they still clot. But when you, there's other things like they may have a fibrinogen level of 800 to 1000 milli, I mean, People focus in on one thing. The problem is that clot is multimodal, thrombocytosis or some other high platelet count. And there's so many things involved in this issue above and beyond just the activation. If you have a 150,000 versus a 900,000 platelet count, you're gonna have be more activation. I think there's so many things involved. You understand transcranial. I, I, yeah. Is anybody ever just sort of discern that it's a helpful assay? in terms of trying to figure out and use it? So, yeah, well, so, I mean, so, yeah, I mean, we've been dealing with this for a while, but what just happened, of course, was this publication by Landscape, which has essentially said that defined a diffusion-weighted MR uh, lesion in the brain as a type two stroke. So I deal with this guy who says, don't bother me with the TCD. You're telling me all this stuff, and the patient wakens up, and they're fine. And fair comment, but now this is basically saying, no, 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 you tell me what the good emboli are going up into your head. Maybe we'll try to just let the good emboli, but there are no good emboli at least going into my head. And so, you know, what is, what is driving this interventional cardiovascular stuff at the moment is the fact that they're saying that 70% in TAVR, it's probably exactly the same in coronary bypass involves, have lesions in their brain and they are dead cells and we must mitigate those things. And so, the rebirth of TCD is happening because it's the only, when you work with a patient on cardiopulmonary bypass, we use EEG. What does that tell you? It tells you about how your neurons function based upon the blood supply. Uh, or you use venous oximetry, which what does that do? It tells you what the venous oxygen supply is based upon your arterial blood supply. And what does it tell you about embolization? Oh, nothing, which is, of course, the most common reason you actually get a stroke in any of these procedures. And so we treat ourselves, and what we're really interested in is debris, particular or clot going on up in the head. And the only way you can look at that 
real time is with transcranial Doppler. No, I mean, I think it's, I think really the surface story is, and I know you worked on this for lots of years, it, we need a better surface. Um, the, the microparticles, there are multiple causes of microparticalization that really are problematic. And, you know, in the VAD patients, I mean, the fact they do as well as they do with VADs, the problem is they all develop, it's a, they all develop GI bleeding, and the von Willebrand factor story is part of the problem on top of it, too. It's such a mess. And, and the more VADs there, I mean, we, VADs can only come back to me. We have a 32-bed ICU, and, and it's like VADs gone bad. I mean, because they all have that risk of, you know, problems bleeding, and then they all have GI bleeding. The HeartMate 2s are now being replaced with HeartMate 3s, thank goodness. But um, it's, a, it's a problem. And once they bleed in your head, forget about it. Additional questions? Okay, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Levy again. Thank you.